That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Funny Face, the fifth film directed by Tim Sutton, which premiered at the 2020 Berlin International Film Festival in the Encounters Sidebar Program. It's being released, released courtesy of Gravitas Ventures on April 2nd, uh, 2021. Uh, and it is, of course, no relation to the 1957 Audrey Hepburn, uh, Fred Astaire, Stanley Donen musical romantic comedy. Of course. Are you familiar with this director's work? Yes. Is there a film of theirs I would know? Uh, no. Uh, I've seen Memphis, his 2013 film, and Dark Knight. Uh, he got a lot of attention for that in 2016. The Batman movie? No. Oh. Knight with an N, not to K-N. Oh. But, however, that film is uh, <laughs> basically a response to the shooting at the uh, movie theater at the Dark Knight. Oh. Oh. Uh, it was filmed in Florida, and it's basically the lives of six people that do get um, uh, encounter a terrorist. Threat well, funny you mentioned Dark, or the, I mentioned Batman because after watching the trailer for this movie, I thought this was going to be something akin to like the Joker. Sure. It is not. Uh, no. And then, of course, Donnie Brook was Sutton's last previous film, which he's probably uh, his most notorious uh, divisive film. Uh, it's about bare knuckle, bare knuckle fighters with uh, Jamie Bell. Uh, and there's some very graphic, violent scenes in that. But also, if you've seen any of Tim Sutton's films, then you know that uh, that director, this director is a fan of long, slow takes, um, oblique uh, ambiguous uh, narratives, and this really is no different. I did see the film uh, at Berlin, the last physical film festival. That's I right, was you able to attend. Seen it. Uh, and I didn't review it then because I think I might have fallen asleep. Ooh. But n no, uh, no Tino shade. Like it was probably my fifth film of the day, and I was exhausted. Um, but watching it again, there were several sequences that uh, I remembered, probably not for the best reasons. The basic story is there is a young man named Saul who's mm -hmm. played by Cosmo Jarvis, which is such a great name. Yes. He lives with his grandparents in Brooklyn who are in one scene and are played by Rhea Perlman and Dan Hedaya. Their story is they're upset because their home, they're being removed from their home because the area where their home is occupied has been purchased by a developer to make way for a baseball stadium parking lot. Yes. Okay. So that's Saul. Then we have Zama, who's played by... Uh, her making her debut, Della Meskinyar. She lives with her aunt and uncle. We're not sure why. She does say at one point that her father had passed like a year prior. Mm -hmm. But she's with them. We're first introduced to her with her running home, like later in the evening. She's dressed like any old chicken head. Like short, whatever, and like sleeveless shirt but right when she gets to the door she puts on a um Nick, niqab which is like a full body covering that only exposes her eyes the relationship with her aunt and uncle seems a little stressed because they seem concerned for her well-being they think her behavior is sort of erratic it's not clear to us that her manner of dress with the niqab mm -hmm. is like something that she has like it would a uh, uh, it would seem that she's adopted this maybe fairly recently as a response to something. Yeah, based on how she goes about wearing it, cleaning it, eating food in it. Yeah. Okay. Saul and Zama meet. Outside of a bodega. Outside of a bodega and sort of connect. Well, in, he's wearing his funny face mask at this point that basically falls out of the sky. And I think that their initial attraction is, you know, they're both people hiding behind... Uh, a mask, per se. Yes. So Saul seems, for lack of a better word, simple. So maybe he has like extreme social anxiety, uh, some mental health issues, maybe some developmental issues. It's not clear, but he seems like he's affected in some way. Yes. To the contrary, Zama seems more well-adjusted, but, but, but she is sort of um, like, how would you describe her? Like, like she seems guarded. Mm -hmm. as a response to something, perhaps. Like, maybe the grief of her parents did. Yeah, like, Who knows? like she has experienced more recent trauma. Yes. So they meet, they kind of connect in a very platonic way that actually is quite sweet because when he first meets her, they kind of spend the day together and then she needs somewhere to sleep. So he brings her back to his grandparents' house and he lets her lie on his bed fully clothed and he puts a blanket over her. And they just begin a friendship. Yeah. That is... 
you know, sort of played out very simply. Okay, in the backdrop of all of this is the developer, and that's how he's credited, played mm -hmm. by Johnny Lee Miller. Mm -hmm. The first, isn't he the first uh, Mr. Angelina Jolie? Is he? I believe so. Oh. Yeah, they start together in Hackers. Uh, the deve oh, the developer is responsible for this baseball stadium that is going to <clears throat> demolish Saul's parents' home. Saul develops sort of a, a, a very sort of like quick random hatred for this person. Well, he, the, the, this neighborhood in Brooklyn is proliferated with flyers featuring him. Yes. Mm -hmm. So he becomes fixated on him and then it would seem that he wants to harm this. So Saul wants to harm the developer for what he's done to his grandparents' home and everyone else. But nothing really comes of it. He, he follows the developer around. At one point, he does assault the developer's assistant because he wants the assistant to call the developer for him. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Uh, the, the film just kind of ends with Saul not accomplishing anything. His, we see that his grandparents were uh, removed from their home because he goes to the... At one point, he visits his grandparents' home and we see that it's boarded up. And Zama is just hanging out with him still and that's it like no, nothing really happens but, yeah that the it becomes a parking lot that he's sitting in and sh the last shot is her coming to meet him yeah okay a few things i think this film is beautiful yeah it was shot by lucas gath um the cinematography is is it's amazing yeah, yeah i mean it's it's i mean there are moments where i think it's almost breathtaking Especially when we consider the, like the backdrop of Brooklyn and, uh, in the score by Phil Mossman is uh, also this kind of broken up remixed electro synth thing that, uh, in several bits reminded me a little bit of uh, parts of Angelo uh, Badalamenti's theme from Blue Velvet. Okay, I think that this movie would make a great sort of like background piece, like if people were you know like socializing with friends and it's playing on the big screen in the background. That would make a lot of sense. Um, the story itself uh, didn't connect with me at all. We can get into it. But I will say this is such a strange film for me because it's one of the most beautiful uh, looking, sounding, shot films I've seen that I think the story is so, I don't want to say bad, but just so, f so not at the same level. Flimsy. It's yes. A, it's a, it's a, it, the narrative ends up seeming a bit flimsy for several reasons, but nothing uh, against uh, Jarvis and Meskinyar, who, no. whose performances are fine. And uh, Jarvis comes across as a little methody, almost like Tom Hardy. Yes. Uh, and he, it, or, and I was reminded a couple of times, of course, of Travis Bickle, the New York character from Taxi Driver. Um, and there are a lot of um, parallels we're supposed to draw with him in the, the James Dean rooting man young rooting man archetype uh because he kind of dresses like that rockabilly stuff or is yeah, that what it's called uh i don't know like the high-waisted jeans and the t-shirt tucked in with the short sleeves mm -hmm. and... and dean is all splashed all over his uh bedroom and he has a nightmare sequence about a, a james dean yeah exhibit. um which made me think of he's rebel with a cause okay. um but in fact most of the shots reminded me of 1970s era james Kahn. Uh, the way that he does, looks, yeah, his looks, mm -hmm. and I didn't realize that he was a musician. But uh, his breakout for me was William Oldroyd's 2016 film *Lady Macbeth*. This very kind of light in August, uh, Faulkner-esque tale with Florence Pugh that is excellent, and I know you haven't seen it, and you should. Um, so I, I like him as, as a screen presence, um, and his relationship with Zama. And the New York setting also reminded me a bit of the Safdie brothers, like uh, Good Time with Robert Pattinson, which you also didn't see. Um, you saw Uncut Gems, though. Yes. Anyhow. The, so the dynamic between Saul and Zama, I think, is lovely and may have worked on its own. But what really doesn't work for me is this background story of the developer. And I think Johnny Lee, I'm not familiar with who this actor is, but... I I don't think it was necessary. Well, his performance, which could have been a function of, I don't know, he just looks like when a chihuahua is just shaking. And there are several scenes that are like, the first scene where we're introduced to him is 
He's a developer who's, I think, being fashioned like a Donald Trump wannabe. Like, he wants to be a real estate tycoon. And there's a scene at a restaurant where the developer has, like, his little wingman who has brought other investors to a dinner. And they've given, they're giving, like, this fake toast mm -hmm. about how they're going to be filthy rich. Mm -hmm. And it's like a, it's like, what, five minutes, four minutes? That was painful. It's painful. Like, uh corny as hell and, and that uh, to me that is cap because it clearly misses the mark on what it's intending to do yes um and i feel like miller's character i think the it's not necessarily his fault i think it's how he was directed and i think it's the script uh i i think if you had excised that completely this could have been a very lo-fi true romance kind of thing with the film true romance with christian slater and patricia arquette oh so then we see the developer at his like penthouse somewhere um, with three women who look like they are sex workers um, having sex. Is it three or four? Three. Oh. Beautiful women having sex while he's watching. And that scene in itself could have worked, but again, the way they have him positioned and looking, I also don't know what that adds to the story. The third scene that I think, well, I just every scene with the developer, then we see a moment when we think Saul is going to attack the developer because he's been following him and right, and he's carrying like a uh, tire iron maybe. And it looks like he's going to attack the developer, but then some, what may have been like protesters who have also been following the developer, egg him. So when the developer gets egged, Saul gets scared and runs away. I thought that didn't necessarily work that well. Then we meet the developer's dad. Well, even before that, we, we learn of the ruse of that early dinner sequence. Yes, that, yes, we learn later that the initial dinner sequence with the investors was just fake. Because the character that made that terrible monologue is very, basically admonishing um, the developer, who we learn is leveraged to the hilt, and go ask your daddy for money, which is... Then Perhaps. we meet the dad, who's played by... Victor Garber. And Victor Garber's fine. His, so he's, he's been successful in real estate development, but he looks down on his son because he sees himself as someone with more integrity. Like, yes, I was about making money, but I also didn't want to do it at the expense of the community. I wanted all of us to be uplifted. Which I think is still corny because it's like, wow, but capitalism. And also, like, you, you know, you're still super rich. You could have gave that money away. But anyway, he's admonishing his son. And then uh, Johnny Lee Miller's character basically has like a tantrum, mm -hmm. runs out of the restaurant, gets in his uh, car, which is being driven for him. And then he just starts shouting money, that's, money. That's and that was like, I don't know what they're trying to do right now. That's, that is a... <laughs> terribly played scene but um, I, I i want you to read the thing you read me from uh, berlin like how the film was described oh yeah uh in the berlin program yeah uh, talked about how it's obviously about urban development and gentrification but described them as two orphans of unchecked capitalism i just don't i like i just don't see that i see them as two displaced people in this you know problematic system but you know if we're going to be um, castigating capitalism, uh, I, I don't. I think this is a very clunky way to do it. Okay. I I guess my difficulty with that angle is Saul. First of all, Saul's, Saul's grandparents. When we meet them the one time, they seem unreasonably upset without giving the audience any background on what the exact circumstances are. Because if you rent, that's just nature of the game. That at some point you could be asked to leave your home, right? Someone else owns your home. So the fact that you rented for 40 years is like, well, that's just how the cookie crumbles. Or if his grandparents owned that home, they were certainly paid market value plus. <clears throat> so they're not hurting. But either way, I like, I can appreciate that if it was a situation where renters were displaced because of uh, bigger development, even though that's not illegal, it sucks. And because Saul is presented as sort of like, like simple, like maybe he's just dumb, he doesn't understand how things work. But the problem is then you have these grandparents who are also like making it seem like they're victims. And 
you know, we could go on and on about the housing issue and all that, but I just think in this story, it did it really connect with me that like Saul and his grandparents are going to be down and out. I, I didn't get that sense. Like they seem comfortable before, they should be comfortable after. Also, Zama is presented like, because there's a shot, the only thing that really happens in this movie that progresses anything is Saul, like on the second day he's met Zama, goes to like a footlocker and buys himself and her a pair of very fancy tennis shoes. Mm -hmm. But when we see her feet, she's wearing like some old, you know, Adidas sliders that are run over and then her socks are super dirty with holes in them and her toes look like she hasn't had a manicure in forever. So I'm a little confused like how she's in that condition when she had a safe place to live with people who weren't like abusive to her, it would seem. Right. It, it, I think we, again, we, we just need a little more background, some, some details to explain yes. wh why, why this is that they have come together and they're going So if they would have done, if it would have been that, like more details and then excise the whole developer plot I, line. I think this could have been a very beautiful story. Because the other thing is when, you, when you're talking about these, these one percenters and these elitists and all of their various problems, you know, t to caricaturize them doesn't do anybody any good. No. Uh, because, you know, most of these people believe that they are good in doing the right thing. Um, so, like, a Victor Garber is fine, uh, but what I really didn't like about that scene is Johnny, Mil Johnny Lee Miller comes in, he meets at the, this restaurant that happens to be the first building Garber ever bought that basically looks the exact same as it does in the sandwich shop. Um, and he misnames the uh, like assistant, the, the 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 Latina woman that lets him in, uh, and she's like, "Oh, I'm not Maria. She hasn't been here for a while. I'm Juanita." And then Victor Garber misnamed her. Also, yeah, which makes no sense to me that he would do that. That it just seems unless they're. Tr I mean, unless they're trying they're... to say that they're both. You know, even though one is claiming that he's more sort of altruistic, really. They're both just in it for the money. Right, and I get that, and I think it does get... But that is such a... To me, it was such a dumb way to do I that. I agree. Because it, it just paints him... Like, he's not a stupid man. No. Like, why would he misname a Juanita who has sat by his side for years? Right. This? So, and she handles all the, the dirty work. He would know her name. Um, right, and then also, what dirty work are you referring to? Yeah, because he does say something like that. Yeah. <sighs> There's a lot left out that I think, had it been explained, would have helped a lot and also this movie is so beautiful in its um visual and audio components that i wouldn't have mind sitting through a little bit more exposition to not feel so like jilted when i was done mm -hmm. because i was saying that i was about as interested the way i feel about this film is how i feel when i get a notification on my phone that says someone's activated the security camera and then I watched the footage for 30 seconds mm -hmm. and they're not doing anything that's how I feel about this movie how I feel about this movie is when Johnny Miller get, Lee Miller gets that egg in his face because that's how the audience feels <laughs> yeah I definitely <laughs> felt like egg in your oh face. this is it we're like and the trailer you know whomever cut it did a very good job of making this film seem like it would have more um, grit and action to it well there's a mood to it so it makes yeah. sense to me that you could condense that very yeah. easily into a trailer but uh, There's nothing going on. No. Anything else? No. So what would you give this film? Two out of five. I would give it two out of five as well. Thank you. Bye.